Hey kia ora church, welcome to our online service, this is Bay Vineyard Church. Online, <laughs> great to have you with us. It is great to have you with us and whether uh, you're a boring adult or a little monkey like these guys, we're stoked to have you with us. Uh, and a little bit later Charlotte's going to be telling us what the kids are up to but until then love you to join in with us kids, we're going to uh, just engage with a lovely song uh, of worship. But before we do that let's say our gathering prayer like we do every Sunday. We We have have gathered gathered in the name of Jesus Christ. We We have come come to this house house and online to worship worship God. We We have have come to confess that Jesus is Lord. We are not here to be entertained. We are here to encounter the sacred. We are not consumers. We are worshippers. We praise and adore the living God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, let's just now still ourselves and enjoy the presence of God as we worship Him. Would rocks cry out to worship? Whose glory told the stars to shine? Perhaps creation longs to have the words to sing, but this joy is mine. With a thousand.
Heavenly Father, we invite you to reveal yourself to us afresh, to open the eyes of our heart that we would see you so that we could indeed uh, worship you. Lord, by lifting our hearts to you and giving you the thousand hallelujahs you deserve and as we gaze upon your beauty and glory and majesty that, that a thousand more would just pour forth and that it wouldn't just be songs but it would be a lifestyle of adoration and worship towards you, that you would be our King, that you would be our Lord, that we would surrender and sacrifice and lay down uh, all, of, all that we are before you and just say, Lord, we're loose change in your hands, spend us how you want. And so, Father, we, we bless you. Just I pray your presence would be so near us uh, this morning. Amen. Amen. Lovely to have you with us, guys. So appreciate you engaging online. Lots of love to all those that are meeting in homes this weekend. You legends. Lovely to gather our church in different homes around the place. Um, lots of love to the Wordsworth family and to the Greaves family who have succumbed to the Rona uh, in this last week. Lots of uh, grace and peace to you. And just pray that you guys will recover very quickly. Um, in an attitude of worship, we want to just take up our offering now. Thank you to all those that are faithful in your giving, generous in your giving to our church. Uh, just so appreciate that. Let's pray. Father, as we give, we give for all sorts of reasons. We, we give because we want to see our church flourish. We give because we want, to, we want to see the kingdom of God break into this region. And that always happens through your body, through your church. Uh, but also, Lord Jesus, we give for our own formation that we would become more like you. Lord, just this generous pouring out our lives as a blessing to others. And so, Lord, uh, just continue to shape and form us. But, Lord, we just take this moment to pause, say that's for you. We bless you. Amen. Amen. Uh, not much family news at the moment, but the only two things is firstly our prayer meeting uh, happening online. We had the most lovely prayer meeting last weekend. We'd love you to join us online. Uh, the link for that's in your inbox, but also on our private Facebook group. Uh, so that's happening 7.30 p.m. PM tonight. Love you to engage with that. Um, the other big news this week is obviously the mandates are coming to an end. Hallelujah, that's fantastic news. Uh, so next weekend we will be online, uh, but we're meeting this week as a leadership team to decide what it looks like for us moving forward. But we're really looking forward to getting back together. When we do get back together, it will be one service. It'll be 10 a.m. and uh, we'll all be together again, which is lovely. Uh, so that's going to be happening soon, so we can look forward to that. Uh, but now it's my great privilege to hand over to Charlotte Buxton, everyone's favourite children's and families pastor. And so Bay Kids, make some noise. Let's uh, give someone a widgie or do something to get the vibe strong because I'm about to introduce Charlotte Buxton. It's my favourite part of the service. Here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, it's my great privilege to introduce to you the one, the only, Charlotte Buxton. to see you again. I'm talking to you today from a slightly different space than where I usually do. This is my study. It's really just a little wooden room outside in our garage that's full to the brim of all my Bay Kids things but it's a really lovely quiet room and it has this really comfy spinning chair and it's good for thinking and it's nice and it's quiet and it's calm and sometimes it's really good to have a space to go when you just want to hide from the world a bit when you want some space and some quiet and some time to be by yourself and this could be your room or it could be a tree house or a bean bag or just a seat outside in your garden I'm hiding out today because our third everyday Bible hero is a little different and he's going to encourage us in a different kind of way. So we've looked at Nehemiah and Esther and they were both pretty big legends who did pretty big stuff in crazy big ways. And even though that's encouraging for us because we know God loves to work through us and that we know they were just everyday people who knew the same God as we know, it can be a little bit intimidating to follow in such big hero footsteps. So today's hero is the kind of hero that freaks out and has ups and downs and wants to hide and has doubts and wants to give up. He sounds a little bit like us on a not so great day, which I actually find very encouraging. Today's everyday Bible hero is also from the Old Testament and his name is Elijah. And despite all those things I've just said about him, Elijah's best hero skill is this. He knew to rely on God in the highs, in the lows, when things were going super duper fabulous and when things were horribly tough. 
In today's story, Elijah teaches us that heroes rely on God in the good times and the bad times, and that God is with us no matter what we're going through. Elijah was a prophet, which meant he'd been chosen by God to speak God's words to his people. But that didn't always go that smoothly, and not everyone cared about what God wanted to say, and not everyone thought that Elijah was awesome for doing so. The worst baddies he came across were a nasty pair called Queen Jezebel and King Ahab. And Queen Jezebel didn't love God, and instead she worshipped statues and false gods. She was very powerful and made everyone in the land worship her statues and false gods too. And everyone was afraid of Queen Jezebel. She was actually quite scary and mean. So it was into this messy situation that God sent Elijah to speak to King Ahab and warn him that the people should stop worshipping those statues and worship the one true God. But King Ahab didn't think it was a problem. He thought that God wouldn't really notice. But it did matter and God did notice and things got a bit tricky. You're going to find out more about this story by watching the videos on our Bay Kids Whānau Facebook page. They're there now. There's lots more going on for Elijah and here's a pretty tough time. But remember, the reason he's included as one of our heroes is that he relied on God in those tough times. He trusted God, he talked with him, he felt alone and like he wanted to give up and hide, but he knew that God was his strength and that God wouldn't let him down and that God was with him. And God's with us too. There's nowhere you can go that God isn't there with you. When you fail a test or lose a race or get in an argument or feel afraid, God is right there with you. When you make a new friend or you eat the best ice cream of your life or you win an award or you meet a dolphin, God is right there with you. In the good times and the bad times, you can rely on God too. So let's pray that we would be close to God and learn to trust him no matter what's going on for us. Dear God, help us to rely on you in the good times and the bad. Thank you that you're always with us and we're not alone. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. So head along now to our Bay Kids Whānau Facebook page for the Bible story of Elijah on video. There's some more teaching around this story and a couple of cool ideas that I'd love you to engage with. Have a really great week and God bless. All right, thank you Charlotte, and uh, kids enjoy uh, engaging with that. Thank you Charlotte for all the work that you do to uh, serve our children and to see our families flourish. Uh, We are now going to move into a time of worship. Uh, We've been praying the prayer of St. Francis of Assisi for the next little season. We're going to be praying a prayer to the crucified Lord as we now just really begin to focus on this um, on this journey towards Easter weekend and uh, I'd encourage us just to really be meditating on what the cross means for us and to be really uh, just to gaze upon it and to let it really just impact us so these words are going to be on the screen feel free to say them out loud feel free just to agree in your own heart but as we worship uh, now we just we want to to look upon that cross and Lord Jesus you stretched out your arms of love upon the hard wood of the cross that everyone might come within the reach of your saving embrace so clothe us in your spirit that we reaching forth our hands in love may bring those who do not know you to the knowledge and love of you for the honor of your name amen There's a place 
Jesus, as we come into your presence, we do stand in awe of you, of your goodness and your grace. We thank you for your great sacrifice. And as we look to the cross, we pray for a new revelation of you, a new revelation of your love for us. In Jesus' name. Amen. This week, we're starting a series of reflections on the cross as we journey towards Easter. As we look at both the beauty and the cruelty of the cross, it's important that we realize this is a big deal. It deserves our attention. There isn't really anything else that's a bigger deal. So we're gonna pause, reflect, wrestle, and work out what this means for us. N.T. Wright says, without this event, there wouldn't be any Christian faith at all, without which the principalities and powers would still be ruling the world unchallenged and unchecked. When I was at Bible college many years ago, I learned a lot about the connections within the Bible. I learned about verses in the Old Testament that spoke of Jesus prophetically long before he walked the earth. And I learned about things that Jesus and others said that come to fruition later on in the Bible. These connections got me really excited because I understood more about the richness and the depth of the Bible. It kind of blew the Bible open for me. 
when we understand the Bible more and more, it becomes more alive and more real to us. In Brian Zahn's book, Beauty Will Save the World, he talks about this really cool connection between the Sermon on the Mount and Jesus' journey to the cross. The Sermon on the Mount is some of Jesus' most challenging and revolutionary teaching. And if you're not familiar with it, it is called the Sermon on the Mount because it's literally him giving a message from a hilltop with his disciples below and the wider crowds below them. It's found in the book of Matthew 5 to 7. One of the most famous passages in the Sermon on the Mount is called the Beatitudes, which means the blessings. And Jesus speaks out eight phrases and they all start with the same line, blessed are the. Well, Zand explains that the hill of the Beatitudes and the hill of Calvary, which is where Jesus was crucified, they're connected. That once he spoke out the Beatitudes and started to live it in his life, it set him on a course which ultimately led him to the hill of Calvary, his death and his resurrection. The Beatitudes are the proclamation and the cross is the demonstration. So the Beatitudes are found in Matthew 5. And my prayer this morning is that as I share these with you, you get excited as well. I'm going to be drawing heavily from Brian Zant and also the NIV Commentary Bible, which was really helpful. So Matthew 5, it says, Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Well, we all know what the poor is, but what are the poor in spirit? Rich Philotus explains it like this. They have nothing to prove, nothing to protect, nothing to possess, nothing to fear. Jesus says that the kingdom of heaven belongs to people like this. They have an attitude of humility, which opens them up to the blessings of God. It opens them up to find abundant life in him. Psalm 40 is a beautiful example of David coming poor in spirit, coming before God, knowing how much he needs God. And in verse 17, he says, Yet I'm poor and needy, may the Lord think of me. You are my help and my deliverer. Oh my God, do not delay. Jesus is saying the kingdom belongs to those who don't have the resources to help themselves, whether it's financially, spiritually, emotionally, or physically. They know they need God. We see this beatitude realized beautifully if we look to the cross. Jesus is crucified between two criminals, difference being that they are actually guilty of their crimes and he is innocent. One of the criminals starts heckling Jesus and, and, and this is in Luke's gospel and he starts saying, you know, if you're the Christ, come down and save yourself and save me as well. And the other guy actually rebukes him and says, aren't you scared of God? Don't you fear God? You're under the same judgment. He then goes on to proclaim Jesus' innocence and he says, this man is an innocent man man. And then he acknowledges that who Jesus is, that he is Lord. And he says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. This is a man who's poor in spirit. He's got nothing, yet he chooses his last few moments to humble himself and ask Jesus for help. And how does Jesus respond? With mercy and grace. He responds by blessing him. He responds by saying, today you will be with me in paradise. The promise in the Beatitudes was blessed are those who are poor in spirit for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. And here we see that this man is being promised heaven. It's not the spiritually rich Pharisees or the chief priests who are keeping the law to the letter that he promises heaven to, but it's a spiritually bankrupt thief. We are not so different from the spiritually bankrupt thief. We all make mistakes and we all fall short. But we have a choice. We can choose to arrogantly go our own way and ignore Jesus, or we can come to him, we can humble ourselves, and we can ask for help. We can receive his mercy. I prayed a very dangerous prayer years ago where I asked God for mercy and I surrendered my heart, but it doesn't just happen once. We can come to him every day poor in spirit, asking him for help, acknowledging that we need him. And every Easter, there is this great invitation that as we reflect on the cross, just like the man next to him turned to him and asked him for help and received his mercy, we can do the same. So let's pray. Lord, we pause to acknowledge we are spiritually bankrupt without you. We ask you now for help and thank you for your faithfulness. Matthew 5, 4 
says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. None of us are strangers to pain and loss. We live in the now and not yet tension of the kingdom breaking in, but not yet fully realized. So that means we still have hard days. We still suffer. We still have heartache. Life is difficult. Jesus says, firstly, you'll be comforted by my spirit in the here and now. But also here's the great hope you have in me that one day every tear will be wiped away and that pain will be no more. As followers of Jesus, we may experience heartbreak, but we do not despair because we know how the story ends. We mourn the things that God mourns, but as we do, we're blessed because we become ambassadors of the good news. We take it out into the world. We're blessed as we bring comfort to those around us, and we can do that because we're comforted first by God and His Spirit. Before we had Eli, we lost our first baby and it was a time of real deep grief for us and Sam was away and there was a conference at church that I was supposed to be running. So I went along, but I had a heavy heart and I didn't want to be there. During the conference, we had to sit quietly and just imagine Jesus ahead in the distance away from us. And he was just, he was coming towards us and how was he coming? God gave me such a beautiful, surprising picture because as I imagined Jesus in the foreground, I saw him and he turned away and when he turned back he was holding the hand of a small person with curly hair and I felt like God said that is the child that you lost and it was this beautiful picture that brought such comfort to my heart because here I was in grief and now I was imagining my child in the arms of Jesus. That evening I was also given a prophetic word by a guy who didn't know my situation at all and he said to me God knows the desires of your heart he sees them and it's on its way. And for me, that was a promise that one day you will have a child. And not long after that, I got pregnant with Eli. Thank you, Lord. Even when we're in deep grief, God brings us comfort. And in those moments, we are blessed. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. We see this beatitude beautifully played out at the cross. The Bible tells us one of the mourners that follows Jesus all the way from Galilee is Mary, one of his friends, who sits at his feet and listens and learns from him. And she's at the cross with other women crying and grieving. And then Jesus dies, and I think she hits rock bottom. But here's the amazing part. She is the first one to be comforted because she is the one that Jesus reveals himself first at the tomb when he's alive. She, he reveals himself to Mary and then she gets that beautiful gift of firstly being comforted and then going out and comforting others by sharing the news. Let's pray. Lord, we pause to invite you into our grief. Bless us with your comfort that we might comfort others. Matthew 5, 5 says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. In this beatitude, Jesus turns things upside down. Often it's the pushy, the loud, the aggressive that dominate the earth, and they make their own little kingdoms. If we look at Russia at the moment and Putin, we can see exactly this happening. But Jesus doesn't say these are the people that will inherit the earth. He says it's the meek. It's the gentle. It's not people that force their own agenda or, or press through with power and might and dominance. Meek doesn't mean weak. Gentle doesn't mean weak. Jesus actually describes himself as gentle in Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29. He says, I am gentle and humble in heart. We actually see a bunch of um, passages where Jesus rebukes the Pharisees and his own disciples for being too pushy and domineering and arrogant. Impressing God with our own strength is not the way to get blessing from Him. We see this beatitude beautifully reflected in the way Jesus enters Jerusalem five days earlier. He doesn't come in with war chants riding a war horse. He rides in gently and meekly on a donkey. The promise was that the meek would inherit the earth and then scripture tells us that the nations are his, that his kingdom reaches from sea to sea. Matthew 28, 18 says, after he's risen, he says this to his disciples, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we pause and reflect on your gentleness. Help us learn to be gentle and humble in heart. 
Matthew 5, 6 says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. If you are hungry and you're thirsty, then you're in great need. And there's a a familiar theme here, because if you're mourning, you're in great need. And if you're poor in spirit, you're in great need. But Jesus isn't just talking about literal hunger. He's talking about this hunger and thirst for righteousness is a passion to put things right. It's justice for the oppressed. It's freedom for those in slavery. It's the end of war. It's the end of poverty. It's this deep groaning we have as we look around and we sit in places of injustice and our hearts cry out that this is not right. It it also includes personal ethical righteousness for those of us who have this longing and desire to live a life that's free of shame and guilt and sin. It's a longing to break the destructive power that addictions have over us. It also includes the hunger for salvation, for God to return, to come, to redeem and restore all things and to put all things right. It's that feeling that you might have in your chest right now when you watch the news and you see the atrocities of the things that are happening in Ukraine. But Jesus' promises is that if you hunger and thirst for righteousness, you will be filled. Only God himself satisfies our hunger. When we come to him, we're filled with him, with more of his peace and more of his presence. We can see this at the cross. As Jesus hangs there, he cries out, I'm thirsty. But he doesn't just mean for water. He's hungry and thirsty to set the world right. That's what he's doing on the cross. He's ushering in his kingdom of love and grace and justice and righteousness and forgiveness. Brian Zahn talks about this old hymn and and the words are so beautiful and they say, Jesus who died shall be satisfied and earth and heaven be one. That's what satisfies God when earth and heaven are one. We see Jesus satisfied as he outworks what he came to do to set us free, to bring us forgiveness, to bring us into right relationship with God. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we pause to acknowledge our hunger and thirst to set the world right. Help us usher in your kingdom with love. Matthew 5, 7, blessed are the merciful for they will be shown mercy. Mercy is such a central theme to the Bible. It's in God's great mercy that he shows us forgiveness. We are blessed when we're merciful. We're blessed when we show forgiveness to those who have wronged us. We're blessed when we show kindness to those around us who are hurting. The religious leaders in the day tended to be much more focused on the laws, and so they lost the mercy. They might have had good intentions. They had this very uh, high standard of purity, and they, they wanted to do everything in the law to the letter, but it meant that they were harsh and judgmental and condemning of those around them that fell short. And because of that, they missed out on the heart of God. Jesus loves it when we show mercy to others, and he promises that that same mercy will then be shown to us. When we show mercy to others, what it does is it opens our heart up to more of God's mercy. It realigns our heart with his. It transforms our heart. We get to know him more closely. Micah 6.8 says, What does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. We see this beatitude in action as we look to the cross. Because it's the criminal that I was talking about earlier that shows mercy to Jesus. As Jesus hangs there, mocked, beaten, and dying, he's the one that shows mercy. And then Jesus responds with mercy to him, promising paradise up ahead. Let's pray. Lord, we pause to thank you for your mercy. Help us show that same radical mercy to those around us. Matthew 5, 8, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Jesus declares here that it's a pure heart that that produces external purity. It's not hand washing. It's not observing the Old Testament laws down to the letter. God goes so much deeper than the skin. He sees through the skin straight to the heart. It tells us in 1 Samuel, the Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. It's only God that can purify our hearts, transform our motivations, realign our passions with His. Psalm 51.10, this is a beautiful prayer to pray. It says, Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit in me. 
I was really wanting to pray this more often, create a near clean heart, God. And I don't know if any of you have read the book Atomic Habits, but it talks about the fact that if you want to start a new habit, you link it to an old habit. And I thought, well, what do I do a lot through the day? I wash my hands. So I thought every time I wash my hands, I'm going to ask God to wash my heart. I'm going to say, create in me a clean heart, oh God. And so I'm doing it. And I don't know if it's working. You might, might have to ask Sam if he's noticed that my heart is changing. But I do trust that God is doing something in me as I pray this prayer to him. The promise is that the pure in heart will see God. The more time we spend with him, the more he purifies our heart and the more we see him working in us he's transforming us he's growing us he's changing us the great hope we have in Jesus is that one day we will see him face to face but until then we can know him as Emmanuel God with us through his spirit and it's his spirit that leads us and guides us and encourages us and convicts us and challenges us day by day if we look at the cross, we see it's not the spiritual experts, it's not the religious leaders or the chief priests that see Jesus for who he really is. It's a pagan soldier, a centurion, a commander in the Roman army. He's not Jewish. He's not waiting for the Messiah to come. Yet he's the one who knows that Jesus is really who he says he is. His heart doesn't claim any sort of spiritual insight. But it says in Matthew 27, when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, surely he was the son of God. There is nothing more beautiful than seeing God clearly. The cleaner our hearts get, the more we can behold his beauty. Let's pray. Lord, we pause and invite you to create in us a clean heart. Help us see you more clearly. Matthew 5, 9, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Peace here is the word shalom, and it points to completeness and wholeness in every area of life, including our relationship with God, our relationship with each other, and the wider nations. While the religious leaders brought division by enforcing what they called peace with might and power, this is not the way of Jesus. One of the Pharisees' main complaints about Jesus was that he was a disruptor of the peace. As followers of Jesus, we are called to work with God to peacefully and gently advance his kingdom. How we do what we do is just as important as what we do. The blessing here is that the peacemakers will be God's children, heirs to the throne. This is shocking stuff for the Pharisees. He's not saying those who keep the laws to the letter will be God's children or those who make the best prayers or do the best sacrifice. He's saying the peacemakers will be God's children. We're God's children when we reflect his heart and character in an angry and divisive world. It's our mission to carry the peace of God out into the world. And we see this beautifully if we look how Jesus responds on the cross. He refuses to respond with violence and anger. He doesn't call down legions of angels to destroy his enemies in a giant bloodbath. He could have, but he chooses the way of peace. He chooses the way of love. He makes a way for us to walk into a place of forgiveness and to walk into a place of right relationship with God. Let's pray. Lord, we pause and reflect on your way of peace. Make us an instrument of your peace. Matthew 5.10 Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This was really important for his followers to hear, especially his disciples, as they went on to suffer so much persecution, some of them to the point of death. As a follower of Jesus, there will be times when people mock you, or maybe people won't like you, but Jesus' promise is, if people are cruel to you because of me, then the kingdom of heaven is yours. My kingdom is yours. Jesus experienced persecution so we can experience the same. This beatitude offers hope for us if we think following Jesus is actually pretty hard because it is. And he doesn't promise that it's going to be easy, but he does promise that he'll be with us.
We never see this more clearly than at the cross. Jesus is beaten and broken and persecuted and killed by the powers and and principalities of darkness. But it's also at the cross that the victory is won. It's at the cross that forgiveness is given. It's at the cross that our inheritance is set in stone, that the wheels are in motion, that God is redeeming and restoring all things. That's exciting. (laughs) Let's pray. Lord, we pause and reflect on your courage. Give us that same courage to build for your kingdom, even in the face of great challenges. Brian Zahn says this, The cruciform is the beauty that saves the world. The cruciform is the beauty of the Beatitudes in full flower. The Beatitudes and the cruciform are ultimately the same thing, one existing in proclamation, the other in demonstrating. It is this beauty that we are called to emulate as followers of Jesus. The ethos of the Beatitudes and the pathos of the cruciform must be that which gives us our distinctive beauty. Churches shaped by the Beatitudes and formed by the cruciform will be a shelter from the storm to the masses of humanity who long for something other than the ugly and unforgiving pragmatism offered by the principalities and powers. Yes, this is the beauty we must embrace the beauty of co-suffering love as defined by the Beatitudes and demonstrated by the cross. When reflecting personally on the cross and what it means to me, I am always humbled and moved to my core when I think about the way that Jesus responds. He responds to cruelty with forgiveness and love. He responds to violence with peace and mercy. He responds to death with fullness of life. We have all heard many different descriptions of God. Some people believe that God is an angry judge and some people think that he's a just teacher. Some people know him as a loving father. There are thousands of stories we've heard about God, but if we want to know how God responds, then we can look to the cross. How he responds there is how he responds to us, to our sin, to our mistakes, to our deepest failures. He responds with grace and love and forgiveness. Because ultimately it wasn't God that sent Jesus to the cross. It was a bunch of angry humans. It was flawed humans like me and you. It was power hungry, deluded humans that sent Jesus to the cross under the coercion of the powers and the principalities that are at work in the world around us. So if we think of our sin and our failure and our mistakes, the times that we're power hungry, the the times that we're deluded, and we wonder how God's gonna respond, I can tell you now that he responds with love every time. And that is the mystery and the beauty of what happened on the cross. So let's pray. Oh Lord, we come to you and we thank you for the richness of your word. We thank you for the depth that can be found in your word when we study it and we wrestle with it and we pick it apart. We thank you that you speak to each of us individually. And so God, I pray as we look to the cross that you give us each a special revelation. That something just resonates with us. Something feels personal for us. And I thank you God for your grace and forgiveness. I thank you that that is the way you respond every time. Every time we fail, you respond with forgiveness and love. We worship you in Jesus' name. Amen.